de youtube bienvenidos a un nuevo video una nueva entrevista una entrevista esperada y que rompe los márgenes del calendario ya establecido porque estamos en unos meses o inicios de año en un mes bastante caliente con todo este nuevo debate que se está armando con respecto a Den Harrow, este proyecto de los 80s y hoy tenemos la oportunidad de entrevistar a Tom Hooker, una persona clave en el desarrollo del éxito de este proyecto musical de Italo Disco. Así que prepárate porque esta entrevista está súper fantástica, todo lo que nos vas entonces está. Súper fantástica todo lo que él nos va a estar comentando. Activa los subtítulos así no te perdés nada de la entrevista, todo lo que Tom Hooker va a estar hablando sobre el inicio de su carrera musical, sobre lo que fue Den Harrow, cómo surge este proyecto, qué es para él, si es Italo Disco o no, nos va a estar hablando si cambiaría algo o no, si pudiese volver el tiempo atrás en los 80s, sobre la música actual y demás, así que empecemos directamente. Well, I started off in the music business uh, at 10 years old or nine years old. I saw this drummer and I was really impressed. Uh, he did this da -da 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 with his drums and I got a drums kit. After, as a kid, I played violin, guitar, piano lessons and all that. But I really wanted to play the drums. So I got a drum kit in the basement. I grew up in Switzerland, in Geneva. And uh, I played the drums while other people were playing soccer and doing sports. And I was doing two or th three or four hours of drums a day. I listened to uh, Phil Collins, the Genesis drummer. Uh, I'd listened to Billy Cobham. He was I put the vinyl records on the record player. And it was a 33 RPM and then I'd turn it to 16 RPM. So it'd be slow, so I could understand the Billy Cobham. By the time I was 15 years old, I did concerts in Geneva. And I also was making money on side jobs. I'd go to the ski resorts, play in a band, and they'd pay me. I'd go skiing in the afternoon, and at nighttime I'd make money and meet girls and all that kind of stuff. It was great. So uh, that's how I started. I was always in the music. So I was a professional drummer. I was doing studio work. And um, we're talking, this is before I was a singer. And I sang it on the drums because I knew English. And I was in Switzerland where people spoke French and they didn't speak English. And then when like, I remember I was in this top 40 band, room and board paid to play with Alain Morisot, which was this group. And um, when uh, Hotel California was in the charts, they said, who's going to sing Hotel California? <laughs> and he said, oh, Tom's going to sing it. Because it just goes on and on. On a dark desert highway, cool wind in my hair, warm smell of colitas rising up through the air. You know, and it goes on and on. on you know, the, there's, there's like four verses in the song. And the only guy who could learn all the words was me. So that's why I sang playing the drums. Uh, in 1978, 79, the drum machine started coming in the studio. So there was less drumming work studio for studio musicians. And I got scared. And also I went on TV as a drummer and I tell mom, hey, I'm on TV. And uh, the TV camera always went towards the singer. And I was behind these drums with cymbals and nobody ever saw me. So I went on TV, but you know, <laughs> So I said, it's no fair. It's not a drummer's world. I'm going to become a singer. So I slowly got into a, a quartet before singing solo. I went into a quartet and I was doing my voices and stuff because I wasn't good enough to sing on my own. So I went on TV as a quartet. I did the Eurovision Song Contest as a drummer the, the, for Switzerland. Being a drummer, I, was, I had access to the recording studio. So I wrote a song called Flip Over and it was... A ripoff of uh, M's uh, pop music. 
So, and I went in the studio, recorded it, and uh, the producer sent it to Gianni Nazo, who was uh, a B DJ in Rome at the time. He was a president of the DJ Association in Rome, and he liked the song. And so went to Sar, uh, Adriano Celentano's record label and Vasco Rossi's label, and they, they were interested in the song. They said, good, and, but they wanted to see me. So I went to Milan, and they saw me, you know, I was six foot two, slim, American, 21 years old, young. They said, oh, wow, let's sign this. This is a real deal. And I had roller skates. So I put my roller, uh, I, did, <laughs> I put my roller skates on. I was signed to a record company in Italy. And I started doing popcorn, free show estate, free show inverno, all these TV shows because there was all these private TV stations. And um, that's how I started in 1980. My, uh, the song was in the charts, kind of, I did Disco Ring with Claudio Cecchetto, that was a big deal, you know. It's funny, when I did Disco Ring, I thought the next day everybody would see me in the streets, everybody would recognize me. <laughs> Nobody recognized me the next day. I'd walk in the street, I was just as uh, unknown as I was before. So uh, most people want to know how it started with the uh, Den Haro project. Well, okay, in 1981 I did the San Remo Festival, it was a big deal, I did a lot of TV shows, I filmed a movie, an act, I was an actor, I did Fotoromanzi. In 1984 I was still doing shows, and in 1985 I met, yeah, in February or, or January of 1980, beginning 1985, I was with a record company. I signed with a rec small record company, Merak Music, and they said, hey, uh, these two guys are looking for a, a guy to sing uh, a new project because uh, the new Den Harrow song, because they signed with Baby Records. And um, I think Freddie Najjar, I don't know what the story, Silvio Pozzoli sang Mad Desire. And I don't know why they didn't want to keep going on with him. I think uh, Freddie said he wanted somebody to be American, perfect English, because in the song, uh, Mad Desire, there's a line that says, ear I am, instead of here I am. And ear I am means ear, this is the ear, and ham is a prosciutto. So it'd be orecchio sono prosciutto, instead of here I am, uh, sono qui. So uh, there's very little distinctions. Um, Italians tend to put H's where there's no H and they don't put it when it's supposed to be there. So it's here and not ear, and it's am and not ham. So <laughs> anyway, I know this is ridiculous, but um, I think that's why they wanted somebody who spoke English to sing the new uh, Den Harrow song because it was a big contract. Freddie spoke English, French. I used to speak French and English and Italian with Freddie. We switched languages all the time because he liked to do that. And um, uh, yeah, so I sang Future Brain, which was the first single, and because it was just a business deal to me. You know, uh, uh, Roberto Gasparini of Merak had a good relationship with Freddie. He said, okay, you, you do this. And to me, it was just an honor. I, I wrote lyrics for some other artists for him. I also did Lucerne with Roberto Gasparini. Uh, that was another project. So Lucerne was, there's no image. And Dene Hero was another project. There was already an image. So it didn't really make a difference. Image, and for Lucerne, we would have probably found an had to find an image. Uh, that wasn't the, the main concern at that time. We just wanted to write music and do songs. The, the whole image thing is something that comes after when you have a, a hit. So uh, we did Future Brain, it was a hit because uh, Freddie put a lot of money into it. Uh, the big video filmed in London and everything, he pushed the song and it, it exploded in uh, France and Germany, which were the markets where uh, Freddie made money. <clears throat> so, um, Future Brain was a single. Freddie said, you got to do the album. Uh, but we got to sign a contract with this Tom Hooker guy, you know, uh, because th there's money involved. So I went to the office, we signed a contract and I had get, I got 2% uh, royalties. The pr producers would get 3%. Uh, Den Harrow for the image, 
they had a contract. And I remember in the office speaking with uh, Pedrini, the, the lawyer, he says, but what do we sign him for? And uh, they, they found, that because he wasn't a singer, so they signed a contract as a mime. Signed a contract as a mime. That was the term they used, mimo. So I would be the, the singer of the song and he had a contract as a mime for the song. They didn't use the term image. So, the, so he was the mime of the song. So he'd get 2%, I got uh, 2%. The producers, Mickey would get one and a half each but they had the songwriting credits because they wrote the songs and I had the songwriting credits, which was the interesting part of the money because you make the money forever. Um, so I wrote the lyrics to Future Brain and then he said, oh, we're gonna do an album, cool. I'll write the lyrics for the album, I'll sing the album and I'll make money on the album. So I did the, the first album and um, it went well. And then Freddie, uh, bought my contract off of Roberto Gasparini because I did a song Real Men with Merak Music with no video, no TV, no promotion, nothing. Uh, so uh, I went with Baby Records, they signed me up and I had a publishing contract where they signed me an exclusive me as a songwriter so they'd give me a, a salary, a, a monthly amount I won't disclose how much they gave me to be uh, exclusive with Alione Music Publishing. So I got a, a publishing um, contract with them. So when we finished the album, we did a single for Tom Hooker and we did Looking for Love. We did a video in London and Looking for Love was a big hit in Italy. Uh, it was number one on DJ television. Uh, Claudio Cecchetto liked it. He was very powerful at the time. It wasn't only Den Harrow, it was Eddie Huntington. We did an album with him. We had hits with Eddie Huntington. Then Paul Lukakis, Boom Boom, did really well. Uh, in, in, but Boom Boom was not really Italo Disco. It did well in America and Australia. So right now there's Italo Disco fans, but what we did was not Typical Italo disco. It was made in Italy, but we we had more of a, an English sound. I mean, some of our songs we were influenced by by Trevor Horn and Frankie Goes to Hollywood and those groups. The so I, Eddie Huntington was Italo disco more than Looking for Love. It's not a typical Italo disco song. It's more like a propaganda uh, type song, you know, an English German influence. Um, so looking for love is not really, the, I don't know if it appeals to the Italo fans because the Italo like the dum da dum da boom boom boom, you know, more uh, pedestrian beat kind of thing. I think it's, it's actually, it's white dance music. I know that sounds strange because in America they have this distinction between black and white music and everything but um, it's not funky. Funky is, is more rhythmic. Italo is not funky. It's very It's not groove like Earth, Wind and Fire. And I, I was right at the, in the 82, like Talk With Your Body, those that were all, I came from funk. I was doing funk in the early, but it, funk kind of died. It was like from 1970s to 83 in the funk. The electronic music took over and the funk was like old. And Mickey Kirigato was very electronic. And he wrote music that I couldn't write because I was really earth, wind and fire funk. And he was more England. So I, I admired his songwriting skills because his music was something that I, I wasn't familiar with when I met Mickey Kirigato. I think, um, yeah, The weekend. Uh, his songs sound very 80s, and uh, Bruno Mars sounds very 80s, and uh, so does uh, uh, Dua Lipa, when, when she's not produced by Calvin Harris. You know, Calvin Harris, a bomb, bomb, bomb. But, but you know, there, there was a lot of bad music in the 80s, and there's a lot of bad music today. In the charts, there's a lot of bad music. Yeah, I don't like the music today, and I don't really like the rap today. I like the rap of the 80s because it was cleaner, it wasn't as, as filthy as it is today. So um, 
I think there is good music today. You just have to be more careful to listen to it. I don't think I would do anything differently. Certainly not the, I don't regret doing the Den Harrow project at all. Uh, it was fun and I, I made money and uh, I was doing music and that's the, the great thing. But in 1983, before I met Miki Kiragato, um, I went to New York because I did an album and I went to the Midem in Cannes and a guy from um, uh, a record company in, in New York invited me to go over there to sign a contract with him because he liked what I did. He had just had a song with Shannon that was number one in the US called Let the Music Play. And he was all excited with Atlantic Records. And they, they brought me there to sign a contract with him. And they put me in a hotel in New York. And I was in a room with all these attorneys and they wanted me to sign my life away to this contract. And I didn't sign it because I didn't know them. I didn't feel comfortable. And you know, music was a family thing. Uh, so the, if, I would do anything differently. Maybe that could have been completely different because I could have signed with a record company in New York and maybe have a career in America in 1983, and, but I wouldn't have done all the things I did in Italy. So uh, that would have been a turning. My whole life would have been completely different if I had signed that contract, but they were very upset with me because I didn't sign and I flew back to Milano. Uh, I, I stayed in New York three days in this hotel. It was very lonely. I was alone. I knew I didn't know anybody and I, I felt really uncomfortable. The only time I saw the guy was to meet these attorneys in some office. And they were really upset because they paid for me to come all the way to New York and they thought I was just gonna sign because everybody in America wants to sign a record contract. It's a dream. And I went all the way over there and I refused to sign with them. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> I must have been nuts. But I didn't feel comfortable. You know, I didn't know these guys. So it, it wasn't about, you know, it's like, here, we're gonna make you a star. This is a contract, sign with us and we'll make you a star. I didn't give a crap about that. I did music for fun with people I liked. I enjoyed life. I had a life in Italy. What was I gonna drop everything for people I didn't know? But, you know, now thinking back, my whole life would have been different. Like I moved uh, into the US in 1994 and it, my life took a different turn. I went into photography and I became a famous photographer, sold millions of dollars in photography, millions a year, and was, was very successful as a photographer. I had four galleries with the employees and everything. Now I'm retired, I shut everything down and I stopped because I don't need to work anymore. But I made money as a photographer, a lot of people don't know this. And I made a lot of money with stock because I have a stock. And I don't know if I have any fans in South America. If I do, I'm happy, you know, uh, hi guys. Uh, amor, corazón, my Spanish is not good. I know cerveza, that's about it. And muy bien. Uh, hello everybody and uh, thanks Lautano for this interview and for all the Italo disco lovers, uh, muchas gracias, chao. Bueno amigos, esto fue todo lo que Tom Hooker nos estuvo comentando, espero que les haya gustado, si fue así denle like al video. Si no están suscriptos aún pueden hacerlo haciendo clic en el botón que está abajo de este video y activen la campanita de notificación así no se pierden ninguna novedad futuro que voy a estar subiendo en el canal. Incluso también me pueden buscar en Facebook e Instagram como Retro Talking Mix, lo voy a dejar abajo en la descripción del video los links para que me encuentren en estas redes sociales mencionadas. Sin más nada que mencionar, nos vemos en un próximo video y un abrazo grande a todos los fans de la música de los 80s y 90s. Chau chau.